this? Ah, uh, if not, you've had a blessed Christmas here today, haven't you? And you are here, and that is exciting. I know that you are here as a direct result of God guiding and leading you. And we should not diminish that. We say, oh, I'm just going to church. No, you're going here because God called you to come here. And so you being here is a response, a direct response to God's calling in your life. That's exciting, isn't it? I'm excited. I'm excited for you. And so I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just excited, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's good to be here. It's good to be excited. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us as we come together and as we uh, seek you again. We ask that you reveal yourself through your word, uh, through my words. And Lord, uh, speak to our hearts that we may see Jesus and that people may see Jesus in us as a result. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our sermon is titled, Endgame, Light with a Purpose. So we come to the end of 2018, and uh, it's time to make stock. I don't know if you read the news, but if you do, you will now, from now on through Monday, you will see a lot of articles on uh, how was 2018. Good, bad, ugly. You know, you'll have lots of in memoriam for all the people that we've lost, and, and we'll have lots of, you know, who won this award and who won that award. And, and, and maybe you have done kind of a stock of your own life. You know, how did we do in 2018 compared to 2017 and, and before? And, and now maybe you're like, oh, we did slightly better, you know. And, and maybe that's what Christmas was all about, you know, kind of depending on where you were the year, you know, that's, that's how your Christmas celebration were. So we're had kind of a tough year, so we're going to do it a little calm this year, you know. But if it was a good year, we go all out, you know, hit the big drum and, you know, and we celebrate. Um, so I don't know where you are on that spectrum, but uh, my question is, is, is that it? So we come to the end of 2018. I, first of all, I never thought I'd see 2018. I thought Jesus would come back a long time ago. Anybody there with me? Yeah? A couple, yes. That's all right. You know, God is patient because the reason he hasn't returned yet is there are still souls out there to be gained for his kingdom, right? So God is patient, but uh, I'm more patient than I am. And, and so my question is, you know, as we come to the end of the year, my, my question is, we went through the year, we went through the motions, now we come to New Year, we're just going to do that again. Another round around the track. Anybody run track and field? I never ran track and field because I never saw the point of wearing myself out, and never gaining ground. All right? I mean, it's just, you run and you come right back to where you were. You know, if I just stayed here, I'd be here, you know? <laughs> But, you know, that's, that's my mind, you know. People are like, let's go for a walk. Where to? Oh, no, let's just go for a walk. I'm like, what's the point? You know, of course, nature, fresh air, sunlight, you know. But, you know, uh, we don't think about those things, you know. I, 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 like, I like to have a purpose with things. I like to, to come up and say, what, what did we do? Did, did, did we come, come close? We, we celebrate Christmas and we do all these things. Why? Why do we do these things? Oh, this is just how we've done it all the time. And so we just, we just kind of follow along in a routine. And, and blessed is he whose routine is stronger. Is that it? I mean, we, you know, we, we celebrated Christmas. And, and, and it's the birth of Jesus. And then I found this text that kind of, where Jesus kind of points this out in Luke 11, verse 27 and 28. It's the Christmas connection that brings us up to, what's the point? Where's the end game? What's the purpose? As he was speaking, a woman in the crowd called out, God bless your mother, the womb from which you came, and the breast that nursed you. See, that's the Christmas. That's what we just celebrated. God bless you and your birth. And we celebrated the birth, and Jesus, you know, could have said, yes, this is good for all people. You know? He could have chided in with, with the angels, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth and goodwill to men. He could have said these things, but Jesus says, wait, wait a second. Yeah, that's good. But more than that, 
Blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. So celebrating Christmas is not an end in itself. It's got to go somewhere. It's got to do something with you. It's got to change somebody's life. If it hasn't changed yours, then let it change yours. But then it's got to also change other people. I love this. Jesus says, yes, Christmas is fine. Celebrating my birth is fine. But more than that, blessed is he who takes the Christmas message out to the world and practice it. And, and wouldn't you know it? I, I said I, NLT stands for New Living Translation, and, and, and I, I put that translation up there because uh, the New King James Version is blessed who he hear, hears the word and keeps it. Uh, and, and that is not really the flavor of what Jesus is trying to say, because keeping it is like, it's mine, you know? Some of you got that Christmas present this year, right? Yeah, I know, I know, you got that Christmas present. Woo, it's, it's mine. Stay away. You know, whether it's candy, can I have a little? No, it's mine. You know, we're keeping it. But that's not what Jesus says. It's not about keeping it. It is about, it's about putting it into practice. And, and the word there is actually a Christmas connection word. And so, by the way, I have to say, if you want to, you know, make a crazy vow for 2019, learn Greek or learn Hebrew. Uh, people, oh, we don't need those. are dead languages. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they are. However, there's some awesome stuff when you learn these languages. And you can see some connections that you didn't see before. And the Christmas connection is in the Word. Because Luke is writing this stuff, and he wrote that Word, put it into practice before. And it's really strange, because you find it in, in Luke 2, uh, verse 8, where it says, Now there were shepherds living out in the, who? in the fields, keeping watch over their flock at night. And you're like, I couldn't hear that word at all. It's the Greek word philoso. Philoso means to keep, to tend, to, to care for, to utilize, or, or to, to follow through in, in, in practical life. And so the, the, the shepherds are out there tending the sheep. Philoso, they're out there putting their life into practice, so to speak. You're not a shepherd because you call yourself a shepherd. You're a shepherd because you're out there keeping the sheep. You're out there with the sheep. Does that make sense? You're practicing what you're, what you're saying you are. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying, you know, as you're out there philosophing, tending, raising, giving environment for growth for these sheep. Blessed are you, Jesus says, if you are vigilantly tending and fostering the sheep of God. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 14, you are the what? You are the light of the world. That's our sermon series, the light of the world. And we've been talking about Jesus. And we spent a talk about Jesus during Christmas. And, but the point is, as Pastor Byron has correctly pointed out earlier, that not only is God the light of the world, He wants us to be the light of the world. He wants us to take that message of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. Not tend it, keep it, you know. Jesus talked about that in, in, the same, in the same text. He says, you are the light of the world. If you take a light and you put it, what, under a basket? Is that what Jesus wants us to do? We well, to keep it safe. It's my little light. We've got to tend it. We've got to keep it. No. Jesus says, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand and it really gives light to everyone in the house. If we are to be light of the world, we need to affect people. We cannot just be ourselves in our little, little sphere. We need, to, we need to reach out, not just in our own little basket, not just in our own little or large church, whichever you think it is, but in the world at large. Matthew 18, uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, gives us, Jesus gives us what our purpose in life is, Right? He gives us, here's our vision statement. We are a growing family, risking everything in Christ to forge friendship, create disciples, and transform our communities before Jesus returns. But our mission statement is found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You know it. Remember it. The Bible says, Me has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore, 
to all the world. What does it say? And make disciples. disciples of all nations, baptize in the name in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you even till the end of the age. That is our mission statement that Jesus has given us. And remember, I spoke about this before. There are four major verbs in this statement. And these four verbs are go, make disciples, teach, and baptize. Three of them are participles. I'm sorry I'm very grammatical today, but uh, grammar has a purpose. And participles are the ones that words that end with ing. And the participles are teaching and baptizing because they're right there in the English language, teaching and baptizing. But then you have the the one that we kind of confuse, and we think that's the command, but it's actually a participle, which is go. Go. It actually should be as you go. Or in going, the command is make disciples. That's the whole point. You can't, you can't just be a light. You need to be shining. You need to be making disciples. And uh, in fact, this is so important that the Seventh-day Adventist Church manual has said now that our main focus of a church board. The main work of our board is discipleship in all its faces. Discipleship is number one. It used to be evangelism. Uh, now evangelism bumped down to two. It's still there, but uh, and, and uh, I'm very glad it, it was there because discipleship is kind of a it's a word that we kind of you know, we, we, everybody puts whatever they want in that. It's kind of a nebulous word, discipleship. What, what does it mean to disciple someone? And so we kind of made it kind of hard. And I think uh, the devil's kind of gotten us to that point because he, he wants us to be unclear about how to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're not particularly successful in the Western world. Can we be honest about that? I mean, if we're going to take stock of anything, let's at least take stock of that. Not only are we not bringing in um, enough people, we are losing them on the back end. You know what that means? That means that, that these people have just become in and then walk right back out the back. And, and they, you know, somebody was saying that Constantine, he baptized his army by marching them through the river, you know, and, and they're, they're all baptized. But as some pointed out, while well, he... It, all you got was wet pagans, you know? And, and, and sometimes we do that in our church. We're so eager to the numbers that we just baptize them and, and we get wet pagans. We haven't developed disciples out of them. Personal, committed people for Jesus Christ. And so the question is, you know, how, how can we do this in, a, in an effective way? How can we be effective lights? And, and we spend a lot of effort on a lot of things and and when we don't understand this principle, and this is not something I have come up with, but it's something that I have, I have worked with, and in every, every district that I have worked in, we've had at least one church or, or two that, that have kind of grabbed onto this, and, and when they grab onto these principles, guess what? They grow very fast, very quickly. And so I want to share, well, I want to be Practical. Can I be practical with you? I've been a little grammatical with you and a little theological. Let me be a little practical with you. How can we be effective in reaching people for Jesus Christ? Because we're not always, we're not always that effective. So I've, I've, uh, I, have, I have it in tears because I like cake. So you have cakes, right? And as, as the cake grows, the tier, the, the smallest, the biggest tier is on the bottom, and then it becomes smaller and, and up so on. And so we, we're looking at, at the various, the same thing. As we go up the tiers, the group becomes smaller. Does that make sense? Um, if you look at it from the top, there are circles. And I've seen somebody put circles, smaller circles inside, etc. But, you know, we'll do tiers. And so we can split the whole world and all the population in the world into tiers. Let's, you know, be systematic about this. So tier one, the bottom tier. Who is this? Everybody. You go to Walmart, that's tier one. You go to Sam's Club, that's tier one. Shall we go somewhere else? What, Kroger's, yes. Target, Target, for those that are fancy. Uh, that's 99% of the population, 99.9%. These are any and all that we have no contact with. 
So everybody, the one that cuts you off in traffic, that's a tier one, right? Now, you can make that person tier two. You can hit them. Because how do you get the person to tier two? Get their name and phone number. <laughs> if they cut off in traffic, you hit them, boom, ah, you got to stop. I need your phone number and, the, you know, your insurance information, you know. Now they're tier two. Not that you should do that. But, hey, this is where you can get creative. Let me put it that way. This is where you can get creative. How do you make a person a tier two from a tier one, a person that you have no relationship with, to get, get their number? This is, tier two is a distant interest. Somebody has attended a meeting somewhere, or, or, or somehow you manage to gleam a name and a phone number, right? That's a stronger interest than tier one. But, you know, really not a very strong interest, right? But still, you have their name and phone number. You could call them up anytime you want to. Tier three, I'll get there eventually. Come on. Have you run out of battery? I'm in a little help back there. Just push forward. There you go. Thank you, Shem. I want to thank all the people that work in the technical booth today. They do such a great job. I'm just, I'm so appreciative of them. Tier three are people that we've gotten their information and then they have come back at a different thing, like attended a couple of meetings or a different couple of events, uh, and we've started now making a connection. Hey, George, hey, Ruth, hey, Peter, you know, we started to get to know them. Now they're tier three, right? I won't give up. I will. There you go. Thank you. You just see when I start struggling, you know, right? Tier four is someone who attends church on Sabbath morning. Now they've they're not just come back to a meeting and stuff, they're starting to come on Sabbath morning. By the way, which, which surprises me, when we get a tier three, we get very excited. Am I right? On a Wednesday night, we do a meeting, and a visitor comes to us on, on Wednesday night, and we get their name and address. Well, like, whoa! And we get very personal with them. You know, how long have you been? Have you lived here in the country? You know, and we talk about, you know, what are your grandkids? And so, you know, what mother's maiden name and all this stuff. We get all that information. Yet when they get to tier four, we stop caring about them. Come on. We get a visitor on Sabbath morning. We go, what are you doing here? If a, if a non-Adventist, or should I say, in Dan Cern's words, if a pre-Adventist comes in on church on Sabbath morning, do you know what hurdles they have already jumped over? They have accepted the Sabbath. See, the, you can't walk into an Adventist church by accident. You can walk into a Pentecostal church, or a Baptist church, or a Lutheran church by accident. Oh, sorry, I thought this was, you know, Episcopalian. Right? You can do that because, you know, let's just say, oh, I'll go to church and you, I'm just going to pick a random church and you pick some, oh, this is not really the church I want to. You can do that on a Sunday keep in church, but when people come to church on Sabbath morning, who, who's open? You know, either they have studied up or they're confused Jews. Right? There are only two groups that meet on Sabbath morning. They have made some conscious choices already. They have already made a commitment for Jesus. They've already committed to, to keep his law and his commandment. This is a strong interest. And we should be excited to have them here. Yet, oh, no, don't, don't get their name. Don't get their information. I had one elder call me. Pastor, Pastor, last Sabbath, when you were in the other church, we had this young man that came into church and said, I've studied the Bible on my own. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ, and I want to become a Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, Praise the Lord, freebie, you know, we love freebies, you know. And I said, so, give me his phone number. Ah, yeah, that. Well, what, what was his name? Oh, I think uh, Tony, Anthony, Tony, uh, something like that. I said, what's his last name? This is way back when we had phone books. Oh, I don't know his last name. I said, if this guy doesn't come back next Sabbath, you and I got to sit down and talk a little bit. This is, a, this is more than a tier four. This is way up there, right? And, and 
a strong interest, yet we're so lackadaisical. We are, we are strong on Pier 1. You know, we're out there, you know, wrestling with people that don't care about our message. And uh, you got to give your life to Jesus, you know. And, and they're like, well, you are a wackadoodle, you know. But then when a person comes in and says, hey, I want to come to church, we go, oh, no, I don't think it's for you. What's going on? We're not understanding this. We got to get, we got to get right. These are people that are positive towards our message. People are searching for a deeper meaning in their life. They're looking for something. And we should be ready. Oh, no, I, I, yeah, this one is, yeah. I'm still, you know, I'm a man of faith, you know. We'll get there. There's two blinks. But anyways, we'll go to the next one. Tier five. Tier five is people that accept Jesus' calling to surrender to him. These are people that have responded positively to a call. These are not baptized yet, but they are, they are top-level interest. These are people that are standing on the baptistry ready to get baptized. These are people that want to study the Bible. They want to get baptized. They made a commitment. They're in a Bible study. These are the strong ones. And so, so now we can... Man, alive. Well, well yeah, sorry, Shem. You just have to sit there. So here, here's kind of where we, where we see them go. So, so tier one, no interest. Tier two, we got their contact information. Tier three, we, they've attended a church function more than once. And tier four, now they're attending church on Sabbath morning. And tier five, they request to be baptized. And then the next point is we get them baptized. And then we enroll them in the same process. Get them involved in bringing people into, into the system. Does that make sense? And, and, and here's my question. Where should, we, where should we be putting in most of our attention? Tier 1 or Tier 5? Tier 5, of course. Low-hanging fruit. You pick them first, right? It's the easy job. We don't realize how much low-hanging fruit we have in our church. Tier 5 and Tier 4. I'll tell you what, as a pastor, uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're good. We'll stay there for a little bit, okay? Uh, as a pastor... Uh, in most churches I've been to, I have solely worked on tier five. Rarely have I had to go down to tier four. And we've grown tremendously. In, in, in every district I've been to, we've had at least one church that have grown phenomenally, 10, 15% per year. And, and the reason is, uh, we start at the top. We don't start at the bottom, right? We put our efforts in where we get results. And, 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 and uh, I've had pastors that come to me and say, well, you're lucky, Sven. You pastor big churches, blah, blah, blah. I pastor small churches, too. Don't, don't get me. I love pastoring small churches. You know why? It's so much easier to get higher percentage growth in small churches. I had a church with 11 attendees. We grew that to 45 in attendance. You know, what is that? 400% growth? I'd like to see 400% growth here in this church. All right? Um, but you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, people, oh, it's just big churches. There. Look, I asked them, have you made an appeal for baptism? And, and, and one of my pastors says, well, Sven, you got to understand, I live up in a very small town. My church is about 35 in attendance. I know them all. I, in fact, I know the whole city. And, and uh, you know, making an appeal for baptism would be a waste of breath because I, I know there aren't any. And I said, well, you know, I think you'd be surprised. I said, what you do is you make it, you, you, you preach one Sabbath, you preach on baptism and making a commitment for Jesus. And then you make yourself little cards with little check boxes on there. And, and, then, and then a place for name and your phone number. And then at the end of your sermon, you hand out these cards and you say, if you, if you want to rededicate your life to Jesus, check box number one. If you have never given your life to Jesus before, check two. If you want to get baptized, check three. If you want to join by professional faith, check four, right? And I said, you do that. You lay it on big. And strong, and you make a strong appeal for baptism. He says, Sven, I only have about 30, 35 in attendance. I said, I didn't ask you for math. I asked you if you made a, com a commitment question. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So he's going to try it out, you know. Hey, at least he wants to experiment. That's a good thing. So, so he calls me up the Sabbath. He says, Sven, I only had 28 people in church today. And I said, great, did you preach? 
And he says, yes, I preached. I said, did you believe what you preached? He says, yes, of course I believe what I preach. You know, because sometimes I, yeah, you got baptism, you know. But, but no, he, I said, you laid it on strong, did you? Yes, yes, made an appeal. Yes, 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 handed out the cards. Yes, yes, yes. How many positive responses for baptism did you get out of those 28 that you know every one of them? Did you get any? He says, like, Sven, I got eight. Eight! That's almost a third of his congregation had not made a commitment to Jesus Christ before. <laughs> we don't realize the people that are closest to us. And I had another pastor who says, my eight-year-old daughter came to me and said, Daddy, I want to get baptized. And I said, you're way too young. And, but, but he says, to humor her, I sat down and I started asking her some questions that I thought would be fairly complex questions. And he says, with theological precision, she answered every single question from the heart. He started crying. I never knew that my own daughter had such a deep relationship with Jesus Christ. She understood her sinfulness. She understood the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. She understood what baptism meant. She understood what it meant to give your life to Jesus. I, I mean, the whole thing. The atonement and everything. She got it right. I, 2,300 20, evenings and mornings, they still need a little work. But you know what? That will come. We got to work on the low hanging fruit. But so, so, you know, this is how I work as a pastor. I start up there, tier five. Anybody here wanting to do Bible studies, you get all your Bible studies together and start working with those. Once I run out of those, I make another appeal for all the people that are attending church. And, you know, and I can, church Sabbath morning is the biggest evangelistic series we have, by the way. You know that? You know, people that come here on Sabbath morning, they're primed, ready to go. I mean, this is what we want. And people come. People come every Sabbath. People on the internet, you know, they're, they're looking on, on. These are prime people. We have lots of them. It, it's streaming every Sabbath, we have about 170, 180 people streaming every Sabbath. Praise the Lord. These are prime people. But sometimes we, uh, we don't always get to work in tier four and five. We've got to go all the way down. And, and you may not have friends and family that are tier four or tier five. So you say, how, how can I get there? So let's go to the next slide. There you go. This is how you work your way up. It's very simple. Hard work, simple concept. Are you with me on that one? When I say simple, it's not simple and it's easy to do. By the way, if anybody says evangelism is easy, give them a little on the head. It's hard work. It's personal work. Right? It's deep, hard, wrenching work. That's what it is. But I tell you what, it's rewarding. And it fills your soul. And if you want a revival in your life, you go and start discipling someone. Take them through. How, how do you get from tier one to tier two? How do you get them from tier one to tier two? Get their name and phone number. Right? Get their name and phone number. I, had a, I, I stopped by QT down here on 75 and Beltline, and I get, get something to drink in the morning. And I, I've done that quite a bit. And so you're not going to go into what I drink and whatever, you know, but either case. We're on first name basis. And then I realized I missed an opportunity because he, he knows by now that he says, oh, it's Friday, it's great. And I says, no, Friday is a stressful day for me. You know, weekend, you know, et cetera. And, and I said, but come Monday. Oh, you know, so on Monday morning, he says, ah, yeah, you're the Monday morning guy, you know. And, uh, and we talk a little bit. And, and he says, so what have you done this weekend? He asked me. And this is just after Larnell Harris. And I said, yeah, we just finished a concert with Larnell Harris. And I said, really? Man, I wish I'd known I would have come. I'm like, yes. I need to get a little quicker up the ladder here. This guy's prime. He's ready for level two and level three. I'm still there on level one. You know, you find that people are much easier to bring up the ladder than you want to. Get their contact information. Start making a relationship on the right-hand side. You can't see it as strong, but this is, I, I wanted to have it right there in the middle. Through every step, you need to start building relationship. You can't just say, can I get your phone number and name, please? No, you say, can I get your phone number so I can call you if there's something coming up, right? I want to call you. Go around asking people, can I pray for you? And when, when they say, yes, can I have your name and phone number? I'll call you back in a month and I ask you how God is blessing you. You think people will be upset about that? 
No. And now he's starting to make a develop, uh, develop a relationship. And as we get higher up on the, on the tiers, the more relationship is needed and more relationship work is needed. So the next thing, get them from tier two to tier three, invite them to events. So they come to, to basketball group, right? You know, and then we have a series of meetings. Invite them to come. If they say no, don't cry, because they're going to come to basketball <laughs> later on. Any anyways, then you can ask them again. Nobody's ever been offended by invitation. Would you like to come? Yes, I would. Great. Right? As they come to this meeting, as you develop relationship, as they come to Valentine's banquet, as they come to the women's ministry, Christmas banquet, etc., you're getting to know them and talk to them, socialize with them. It's like, hey. Uh, if you really want to know what Adventists are like, why don't you come to church this Sabbath? Invite them to church. If they say no, that's fine. You know they're not ready for tier four. But if they say yes, boop, they bump up. Right? And then when they come to church, you start invi inviting them and say, here, let me show you a Sabbath school group. You know, a Bible study group that I think you'll like. Oh, this person, you've got to meet this person. This is such a nice person. We have so many nice people in this church. There's no problem for you to connect them up. Take them to visitor's lounge. You know, fellowship with them. Right? And then how do you get them to tier five? Invite them to study. Now, here's, here's where we do a mistake. You know, people come in there and they, and they start to go to tier one people, asking tier five questions. Right? That doesn't always work. When you go to someone off the street, hey, do you know Jesus as your personal savior? You know, now you're the wackadoodle. Right? That's not how you do it. You got you to you take them up the ladder. Right? If, if they're tier one, ask them tier two questions. Can I have your name and phone number? Right? I missed it yesterday too. I am so upset with myself. I miss lots of opportunity, but I'm sharing them for you because I learn so you can learn too. Yesterday we're sitting there, we had a, uh, no, not yesterday, uh, Thursday night. We had a carol and plant meeting and we were at the restaurant. And as we're sitting there at the restaurant, this, this lady comes up, so I'd be eating over on the side. She comes up and she pokes me on the, on the side and she says, oh, Karen says to say hello. Apparently, I don't know which Karen it was, but I think it was uh, singing. Well, I can't say singing, Karen, because you sang here. Karen, when, when, I, when I, yeah. Anyways, I think it was one of her friends that came up and said, hi, blah, 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 you know. And, and, and as, as, as I, we smiled, we laughed and talked, and she walked away. And then some of the group members like, Sven, did you get her name? No. You know. But, uh, you know, I need to be a little bit more forward, and, and we can, you know. Get their name and phone number. Get them up. Ask them tier, a tier two person, ask them tier three questions. A, a tier three person, ask them tier four questions, etc. You know, my mom asked my brother all the time, we're going to church now, Tommy, do you want to come? We're going to church now, Tommy, do you want to come? And no, no, no. Down the line, 18 years old, all of a sudden, yeah, sure, I'll come. What? <laughs> all of a sudden, our schedule changed. You know, but that's okay. Keep asking. Get them up the line. Build relationships with them as they walk up the line. Because the Bible tells us we, we want to reach out to these people. And this is a simple. It's not very hard to understand, is it? The concept. The concept of just bringing them up the line. If you want more information on that, by the way, you can participate on all levels. You can participate in level one, if, in tier one, if that's what you want. But I, I would like for you to be tier five. Let me go back to the other one. Yeah. There you go. I, I, we think that only pastors can give Bible studies. You know, in Africa, they're growing wildly. And in Malawi, I had an elder from Malawi. I may have shared this before. I'll share it again. And I'll share it again after this. I talked to an elder, came and visited us in Bergen, and I said, you know, we have moderate growth here in Bergen, but, but you know, in Malawi, you're growing fiercely. And he's like, yeah, we are. And I said, how come you're growing so fast? And he says, I don't know. I said, it's because you offer them food, which is kind of racist, by the way, to ask that. Don't ask that. And he's like, no, we have food in Malawi. And I says, I'm sorry, I, what do you do? And he says, we just, I don't know, he says, we just do Bible studies. I said, well, we do Bible studies too. And he says, yeah, but, but see, in Malawi, in our church, if you are to be an elder in our church, you have, to, you have to commit to at least giving five Bible studies a week. Yes. Can you imagine what would happen in this church if all our elders gave five Bible studies a week? Yes. There's a correlation here. Amount of Bible studies 
is directly correlating to how many baptisms you have. So if you have many Bible studies, we have many baptisms. We have few Bible studies, we have few baptisms. That's just how it is. It, it, you know. So if you want many Bible, many baptisms, what do you need to do? Lots of Bible studies. The more Bible studies, the more baptism. That's just simple math. It just works. Uh, and so, uh, so he says five. And I said, do you give five Bible studies a week? And he says, no, I give 20. 20 Bible studies a week. He said, a regular church member is only encouraged to do one Bible study a week. But most members do about five. Can you imagine? Why are they growing in that country? Because people are involved on tier five level. Not just the pastors, but everybody is involved in being a Bible coach, helping somebody, a baptismal coach, whatever you want to call it. And people say, but there aren't enough people out there who want to study. Absolutely there are. There are tons. We can get, I had one guy who stood out with a sandwich board out in the street and says, free Bible studies, call blah, 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 blah. Within half an hour, he had nine Bible studies. Half an hour. People are hungering and thirsting for the gospel in Richardson. But we are kind of kept back because of the same reasons that my personal ministry director in Bergen. He asked me, how many Bible study invitations do you want me to send out? I said, send it to the whole city. And he says, no, Sven, that's, that's 55,000. If we send that out, we're going, to get, uh, we're going to get about 80 responses back. And we don't have the manpower to, to help 80 people study the Bible, which is kind of, kind of sad. So I said, how many, how many can we handle? He says, we can handle about 10. So he sent out enough invitations and we got 12 responses back in pagan, secular Norway. We're in the Bible belt. I mean, we're fishing in a barrel here compared to Norway. But I'm telling you, it, people are hungry for the Word of God. And we need everybody to step up and say, so in 2019, I want, I want to challenge you. Can, you. can you commit to do one, one a week? Five a week? Ten a week? People are hungering and thirsting. And the reason we're not getting more Bible studies is simply we're holding back because we don't have enough manpower to take care of all the Bible studies that are coming up. So I encourage you, take this opportunity. The light card. You can take people up the scale on this one. This is not a prayer list. Remember we use this one? Use this systematically. Put the names of the people on there that you want to pray for, intercede for. Bring up the ladder into baptism. And baptism is not the end game, my friend. Baptism is the beginning. Because at that point, whoever gets baptized goes back down and starts bringing people up the ladder. Does that make sense? And that's discipleship because you will not grow more as a, as a person with a relationship with Jesus Christ, that when you are out there working for Him. I hear it all the time. People say, oh, we want to do inwe. We need to fix ourselves before we can fix others. And I says, no. By fixing others, you fix yourself. By going out there, by giving Bible studies, by putting your head out there and, and people see imperfect you, they will be led to Christ, and you will be led to Christ, and you will start to develop a relationship, and you will start to say, oh, I need to pray more. I need to study more. I need more of Jesus. And you will see a vibrant and strong study and prayer life as you get involved in helping others come to Jesus Christ. The Bible says, let your light shine. Let your good deeds shine for all to see that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The end game is Jesus Christ, bringing everybody to the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're not filled yet. Jesus hasn't come back. He's waiting because there are more people still wanting to give their life to him. And I encourage you, as we go into the new year, commit to giving Bible study. Be a Bible study coach. And like, I'm way too young. I'm only 12 years old, 8 years old. You can be a Bible coach. I have a book in my office about the child preachers of Scandinavia. Some of you remember Ellen White wrote about that. You have kids all the way down to the age of three preaching the gospel. So if you want to do that, we'll get you set up. We'll get you started, no matter what age. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Will you be a light to this world?
Amen.